Hello. <laughs> I don't know if you could hear that rooster in the background. But joining in in our sangha. <laughs> it's actually a little bit of a funny story. It's I don't know. I think Michelle has told a little bit about. Uh, maybe I did as well at some time. Um, this hen that laid some eggs uh, around her house at some point, and then like they all got eaten, and then they hatched, and all the chickens, all the you know little baby chicks got killed. This happened like several times, and then finally one little chick survived, and it was amazing to see how it survived. It like finally learned how to like fly up enough into this tree, you know, and and roost there at night, and so it made it, you know. Anyway, a couple months ago, it turns out it's a rooster. <laughs> Which is a lovely addition. Mm, wonderful to see everyone. Oh, let's take a look over here. Gosh, it has been a while. Wow, Galen, that's an awesome costume. Mm. Well, yeah, really wonderful to see you, wonderful to be back, really. Um, it was so great to be able to have some time off to practice and, um, you know, just, of course, d jump back into all of that. And so just, you know, deep appreciation to Kay in particular for holding the space this whole time and making sure everyone had the kind of backup and support and everything that, we all needed so just and I was just I was just telling her I was like just so reassured every because Sundays would come around and at some point I'd remember that the sitting was happening you know whether early or later and um, I was like oh, okay he's got it all you know once in a while I'd be like is everything smooth it's everything smooth so just really super wonderful and I know Amanda helped one weekend too with that and just of course uh, Tan and Sun and Quinn and Barbara and William and Harry I think that was a uh, most of the list. I don't think I'm forgetting anyone of, of folks that held the space in that way for practice um, during all of our absences and um, just wonderful to to know that we have that sense of yeah being able to share the space a little more and I don't know you know how that'll grow and change but of course we're in a time now where some things are coming back online or back in person and um, you know there's a little more travel there's a little more stuff like that on our ends as well, so you know this this sense of, um, of course, that the sangha is is stronger than you know, uh, just us. I said Barbara Harry, um, uh, a, you know that there is a a, a self propelling and supportive force um, that can be um, leaned on and um, assert itself, and um, you know. We, of course, we don't always know what that looks like ultimately in the, or even in a progressive sense in terms of the online stuff we're doing, but it's, it's happening. Um, okay, no more direct messages. It's too much for me to stress out about. I can't read things and deal at the same time. Yes, I mentioned Kay, Julia. Okay. <laughs> um, and then of course, Steve and Jake, it was great that they, you know, came back and it seems like it was super nice that they, um, you know, held the space uh, for a couple of weeks and they're just a great team and uh, have their own wonderful dynamic. Um, they, Steve, Michelle and Jake right now are all up in British Columbia, getting ready to go to Hollyhock to teach that retreat um, in the coming days. I mean, maybe some of you will be there. I think that you will actually, and I look around. Um, and, uh, I am actually going to be traveling this week. I'm going to travel with my mom a little bit, uh, something we've postponed several years. Um, but Darine will be with you all the next two Sundays, um, before Steve and Michelle come back the, the following one. So we'll, we're, we're just happy to sort of have this flexibility and robustness of keeping coming back and, uh, keeping the continuity, you know, of, of this space. If it's not necessarily a physical space, right? So I'll just 
take one more look at everybody. Hmm. Yeah, all right, well, let's sit for a little bit. As you come to let your eyes close, settling the body into some relative stillness. Just being careful right off the bat with the quality of attention that we are bringing to whatever we are observing. so easy to start with a kind of hardening of the mind, a sort of trying to force things to slow down, a tightness, control. It's not to say there isn't ever any appropriateness to that kind of, some, some elements of that firmness and strength of mind. It's also important to see that things are moving so quickly at every sense door. That actually it, it helps to have the mind be more nimble, more light, more fluid and flexible. Sometimes we have this idea that we need to get deep, right? And that the practice is plumbing the depths of our innermost everything. And there is a reason for that perspective. But there's another truth that's so important in Vipassana that we don't need to plumb the depths, that actually just skimming the surface is sufficient. In fact, it's all there is. There are no depths. There's just what's happening in this moment, in hearing, seeing, smelling, tasting, physical sensations, the mind. There's just what's happening it's arising and it's disappearing. And the next, and the next, and the next. So if we bring the attention to the realm of sound, being careful to feel like we need to dig in, dive in, grasp. But actually lightening the attention, lightening the energy and quickening it to keep up with sound changing, always moving, never still. not happening out there, the awareness is in the mind with sensations at the ear door. Maybe we don't even see it very clearly, just get a sense Sound changing moment by moment, faster than we can see. Perhaps we see the mind 
throwing up a thought, an image, an idea, a perspective, an opinion about what we're hearing. No problem. That's the mind moving, moving, changing. Back and forth between mind, sound. Noticing the sensations arising in the body. Perhaps just the general sense of the field of the body. We put a value on the process of mental noting, noting pressure, noting tension, tingling, heat, coolness, motion, stillness. Sometimes that slows the mind down too much. The body is happening much faster than that. Sometimes a, a lighter touch with the attention. Noticing this constant flux, this dynamism of change before we have time to name and label. Seeing the energy that that takes in the mind. But not a hard energy, not a tense one, a buoyant one. We see the mind's response to the body, ideas, opinions. We hear sounds, we feel the body, we notice thoughts, ideas, imaginations. See them weaving together. And smells and tastes, visual impressions, even with the eyes closed. The sense of coherence being woven together with this flood of conditioned experience at the sense doors. Not needing to control or manage it, perfect it. trying our best to observe. And the observation itself can be seen, can be noted. There's no coherent, steady, persistent observer. Just moments of observation, moments of sound, of sight, physicality, mentality. And we can just hang out and try our best to keep up with it. When it gets too wild, too crazy, we get too tired or caught up, we can anchor the attention just in the breath of the abdomen. There's enough to watch just there. 
enough change, enough movement. Just the stream of sound. Just the mind knowing, thinking, constructing itself. Having the concentration be a permission, allowing ourselves to listen in to one channel of our experience more closely. And for now, with this same lightness, dexterity, flexibility of mind.
um, before I offer a little talk, I just wanted to make a couple announcements because I know some people can't always stay the whole time. Um, but just to let you know, we've opened up registration just yesterday for the June online retreat. It's June 9th, June 10th to 19th. And you can register just for the first weekend or the whole week or, you know, nine days full time or part time. So there's a few different options as we've been doing. Um, we'll send out an email soon about it. Um, there's just a few other pieces of that email. I have to get ready before I can get that out. But just so you know, it's open and we're excited. Um, it'll be uh, Michelle, Steve, Darina, and myself. And um, and also, oh, just to, to let you know, something kind of neat happening to look forward to is um, after we sent out that email, uh, you know, some months back about what to do with our, like, recorded, all this recorded material we have, and um, someone offered to um, donate to help to pay for us to build an app so that we'll have our own um you know, cell phone app for instructions and talks. And basically, so, you know, trying to get everything that from the online courses of the last couple of years that's been recorded, sort of formatted and cleaned up and stuff like that to kind of get up there. So it's really cool. It's exciting. Um, the The app is pretty much done. And there's a few volunteers, Amanda Kless, uh, Stefan Benoit, I think is how you say his last name, um, have been like just going through all the stuff and getting it ready and uploading it. So it's, it's happening. We have another person now coming on who has some more time the next month or so to really try to put up a bunch of material. So, um, it'll be, it'll be, um, it'll be neat. It'll be fun to have. And just like a good use of our, um, you know, just these resources that we have, I want to make them available, you know, of course, freely to, to you all and whoever might be interested just to have them. Um, I didn't have much work to do while I was on retreat, which was great. Um, this was one thing I was keeping up with just a little bit. It didn't require much, but sort of checking in a little bit. But it turned out the developer um, who we got to do it, this great young guy in, in Los Angeles, but it turned out his whole team is in Ukraine. Um, and so early on in the retreat, you know, I was like, uh, you know, if you guys want to wait on this, that's fine. You know, like, the, obviously you have bigger things to deal with. They're like, no, no, we want to like, you know, they're in Lviv, or how do you, I don't know if that's how you say it, you know, in the Western part. Um, so it was a little bit quieter for a while. Um, but they just worked through it and they built this thing in the midst of such, you know, madness. Um, they would take breaks apparently from our app and, go build Molotov cocktails in the kitchen for a interesting <laughs> reality of where we are in this world and how these things unfold together. Um, but, uh, but it adds a sort of powerfulness to the fact of it happening. You know, it's not just abstract or something, right? These, these people who do this stuff, it's like, no, they're, they're people and they live in real places with, you know, very real things happening. So it's kind of a miracle really that it's happened and we're um, feeling really good about it. So um, keep your eyes peeled for that. That's pretty much it. Let's see if I can make sense of my notes here. Not really, but we'll see what we can do. I was speaking with Michelle, you know, and they had to, they flew over to British Columbia and, you know, they did a red, red eye and it's like, oh my God, they're, they're cooked. And it's hard to, it's hard to come off retreat and, <clears throat> you know, be very kind of concrete and conceptual. You spend so much time trying to let those things go. <clears throat> so it's a good exercise. Sorry for my voice. I can see I'm still 
getting used to talking. So yeah, I just, you know, the it was a very powerful retreat and I just thought I'd offer a short kind of talk based on some of what came up during my time practicing. Sometimes, as many of you know, retreats can be, you know, like you sometimes you kind of cruise through them and they just feel sort of steady and nourishing. Sometimes you feel like really like strong and with it and there's you're I don't know you're you're making linear progress in a way that whatever true or not it feels like that right um or and you feel capable you know and then some retreats are just hard you know and this this was a harder one for me um I think I just appreciate so much that, you know, in our practice, there's so much effort put into getting to train the mind to see things as they really are, right? To building up enough concentration, enough mindfulness, enough of the Brahma Vihara qualities of heart. And, and all the other beautiful factors of mind, you know, to sort of come together to be able to, to see things non-conceptually and the, the, you know, building up this incredible capacity of the mind. And, and in that process, you know, there are just so many insights that happen about the nature of reality and the truth of things and, and the, you know, anicca, dukkha, anatta, the impermanent and unsatisfactory and non-self nature of all things. And, you know, there's that sense of being rewarded with insight and um, and how inspiring it is and how powerful that is, you know. Um, and then I think that the other part that we actually try to talk about a lot in our teachings, all of us, um, is this sense of really also just learning to observe the resistance to the truth, to understand <clears throat> why the mind defends against reality, defends against anicca, dukkha, and anatta, and to, and to truly try to understand, have compassion for, have patience with, um, and deepen the, the wisdom that comes through understanding why the mind actually doesn't want to be free right? Because we want to be free. <laughs> you know, we're, we know that we're entangled in greed, hatred, and delusion, and that we have these defilements, and that we're not perfect. You know, we see, hopefully, the more we practice, the more humble we get, you know, about our imperfections, and the places where we're impatient, or we're jealous, or we're craving, and, or we, we fantasize about, you know, something that will satisfy us in a way that will be for you know longer than a few moments <laughs> uh, and to sort of like the sense of also then being willing to not be at war with that process internally um not try to override it because you think you know the truth and that the mind should go, that the heart should be willing to, to go back to seeing the truth as you've experienced it. Um, but instead to be patient and to watch the contractions of the heart, to, to be willing to go through the, and understand the suffering, the nature of suffering of why do we do this? What are the mechanisms of it? What are the formulas in the heart and mind that lead to the contraction? And, and how do we better understand it through um, building a relationship with anger, a relationship with stress, a relationship with craving, um, with delusion? Uh, rather than thinking it's always the enemy, the thing to get over, the thing to to break, you know, to break down. Not that there isn't some piece of that, but the practice ends up being, a lot, you know, less linear, less less sense of like you're just trying to get to this experience and rather really trying to understand experience, understand the mind's relationship to experience. I sometimes think of the... Um, 
the movie The Matrix, if anyone's seen it. There's, it's the the, the this part of it is really taken from you know the Alice in Wonderland. But the the main character, uh, the protagonist, he's kind of given a taste of the truth, and and then sort of his guide gives him two options, right? The blue pill or the red pill, and I can't remember which is which, but say the blue pill is like you just go back to the reality you thought you were in before you're just ignorant. You don't realize there's this whole other thing going on and you just try to live in that sort of like version of things, you know, or you take the red pill and you go deeper down the rabbit hole, right? Deeper into the truth and the bewilderment of that. And so there's this sense of, you know, having to make that choice to let go of conceptual familiar reality and, and committing to this process. And I think really, though, actually, our, our practice is like we take the red pill and the blue pill, you know, at the same time. And it's like very disorienting. You know, you have the sense of like insight and seeing the truth of things and how wild it is and, and being liberated at times from the prison of our own making, you know, of the heart's own um, boundness to its desire for a certain kind of stability and trusting the truth of things and seeing the security and release and letting go and and in the fact of not being threatened with anicca dukkha nanata um, but then a lot of our time really is spent not in that space you know not in the deepest equanimity not in the deepest loving boundless loving kindness you know and so this sense of like ah you're going like going back and forth you know and and as lay people you know not having that protection perhaps that some monastics have these days i don't know you know many monastics are very busy and lives are very social and um i think it can be hard in a lot of countries to still really find you know sort of seclusion but still there is permission to be um more pulled back, more withdrawn, more sort of internally focused in a lot of places. And so this sense of living both in the freedom and in the reactivity, um, it's a lot to ask. And so, yeah, I think, you know, my retreat, it's like there was just, oh, so much time really. So it's just like the mind was so tight and so tense, you know, for, for many weeks. And, um, and then even then, as it starts to relax, it's like when the mind starts to relax, <laughs> then you're really in for it. You know, you think that's what you're looking for. You think it's like the tension of the mind that's like the, or the body. It's like, oh, these little knots or entanglements. You think that's like the thing you want to get over. And then those things start to loosen up. And then you're in like the thing that those have been protecting you from, right? The real sort of like bewilderment or um, hardship of a different quality. So... You know, just that that sense of like, oh, really? Um, and, you know, I just feel so appreciative of the practice and, um, you know, particularly, of course, of Michelle's teaching to me of just like, you're not, it's like not trying to get anything and just really um, trying to build a relationship with what's happening. And can we, can we truly be interested in, the contraction of the heart and the tension and the the not wanting or the wanting or the the delusion and the tendencies towards delusion and and to un- try to understand like how are they serving us you know and to understand that we they must be serving us some way because otherwise we wouldn't keep going back to them uh, for our sort of sense of security and so to 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 develop that sense of of you know, patience beyond time, like patience without expectation that, well, if I'm gentle and if I'm patient, then it'll open up or like, no, like this, this, this could just be how things are, you know, and how are we going to be on our deathbed if, if there's annoyance, you know, or irritation or unpleasantness, which like probably there will be, right? You know, the there's a good decent chance that it won't be there will be things uncomfortable there will be things that are confusing right the the mind's ability to to keep things contained and under control and tightly kind of configured is often loosened you know and so how how do we operate with the mind and and uh that is less intact a body that is not behaving 
as we would like it to behave. Um, these are true in every moment for us. And that sense of like, oh, right, what's, what's really the expectation? Can we find a sense of caring, of understanding, of appreciation? To understand why the heart chooses to do these things it does. Why does it look for comfort in these places, stability in these places? And in some ways, it's not very hard to to understand, you know, that these truths that the Buddha pointed to of constant change, of, you know, constant fluctuation, of lack of satisfaction. That's not a word I was about to say. Satisfactability. <laughs> uh, the, the, the sense of like, there's, um, you know, nothing lasts long enough to even sort of provide stability or, or satisfaction, even the self, right? This, it's like, well, of course, that's very scary, you know, to the mind, um, the, the aspects of the mind that are not yet okay with that, or that are not necessarily trained for that yet. Um, that don't find that liberatory, right? That find that terrifying. And where do we find, <clears throat> why is it so hard to find a basic sense of just like <laughs> acknowledgement, right? Of like, yes, of course. Yes, indeed, it is terrifying. Yes, actually, when, when the mind, you know, you start to sort of, you have these layers, right? Of like, there's the, the, the us thinking that feels very familiar, you know? Um, and then you have, and then it feels like you're doing it on purpose, right? You're thinking on purpose. And then, you know, when you're a yogi and you're sitting or you're on retreat, this sense of that it's irritating, like you see that it's not, you're not doing it on purpose, that the mind is like just relentless, you know, and it's kind of conjurings, you know, and repetition, the patterns. And then sometimes you kind of drop below that and there's this sort of more weird, but kind of creativity there is bubbling up of like a little more abstract, a little more fluid, a little more dynamic, but also very, sometimes very enchanting. Um, the, we, we have projects or ideas or, you know, things we want to compose, write or whatever, you know, and then if you don't get so enchanted with that, it's like jeeping below and like below that, there's, there's this just, relentless stream of nonsense that is much of it barely ever forms into a full thought or a full notion it's just this sort of ancient kind of stream of gobbledygook you know and and sometimes it feels like either there's um coherence in there but it doesn't necessarily feel like our voice that we're used to internally um there's things that might be more disturbing or really um, not self, you know, and the sense of how wild and weird and kind of bizarre that can be. Of course, the mind, then it's like, of course, that's weird. Of course, you don't want that. You don't want, you can't function going around like that, right? So that the mind is going to like rehearse itself. It's going to rehearse the version of itself that's like solid, that has its views, that has its take of things it's going to rehearse um you know something for me if it comes up a lot is like music right just like just songs that kind of get stuck in my head you know on retreat and that sense of um of really appreciating it's like oh this is just the mind trying to keep itself together it's like trying to trying to be familiar right trying to sort of like um uh create enough familiarity that it's me and that that solidity of that provides like some safety, you know? And it's like, why is there anything wrong with that? Why do we, why do we give our minds maybe a hard time for the repetition, for the persistence, right? For the relentlessness. It's just aversion to this, right? To this insistence, to this trying to solidify. A lot of that times you'll see it's like, it really is aversive or it really is craving thoughts. You know, there is just this sense of we're using aversion and you know craving and aversion to create a sort of surface tension of self that um persists that doesn't disintegrate right because if if the mind stops doing that when the mind lets go 
then it does. It's like actually the mind, it, it does disintegrate, right? Every moment is changing. The self, sense of self emerges, the sense of self dissipates, a sound, a sight, a smell, a taste, a touch. All these things are just sort of coming and going. Mm, the sense of self is actually not that coherent, not that consistent. And if we're not familiar with these weirder spaces, right? If it, we take our time, um, sort of moving into them that in a way that feels safe and letting the mind come out and feel like, oh, it's going to pull itself together. Let the mind rebuild itself, you know, um, even though we might know that it's, uh, you know, futile on some level, like a sandcastle, futile, not futile. Uh, that it's still, it's like, okay, right? You don't have to give yourself a hard time for seeing like, oh, there's a, there's a stress in that. There's a tension. There's a, um, a fear, right? There's a discomfort in things as they truly are. And there's nothing wrong with actually watching the mind rebuild itself. What's painful to see is the ways that it does it around aversion or craving or delusion, right? That that's actually the, the deepest trainings of the mind or to do it around what we think of as the, um, you know, these hindrances or the kilesas, right? Like the defilements, these heavy words for these protective patterns that the mind uses to feel safe in the midst of all this flux. So what you see is like, okay, concentration actually builds a degree of similar stability, also fabricated, right? Whether it's concentration on love and kindness or uh, karuna or mudita, upeka, you know, the Brahma Viharas, whether it's concentration on sound or the breath, it, it is one of the, the values. What's the, one of the important things is that concentration is developing a sense of safety, a sense of solidity, a sense of um, stability amidst the chaos and wildness of things um, that can be an alternative, right? To the ways that we do it through greed, hatred, and delusion. But we can't always rely on those either, right? And so the sense of, um, and that, that from that place of concentration and building a development of concentration, then we still bring mindfulness so that we're able to observe the instability of things, but from a safe place, right? From a place of feeling like, oh, we have some of the jhanic factors of vitaka, vichara, and um, uh, piti, sukha, kagata, the sense of you know rapture, or just the pleasantness of a little bit of concentration the tranquility of that, and then observing the wildness of reality from that is a little bit safer, you know. And it's why there are some schools, of course, in our tradition that f put so much emphasis on concentration before you even do Vipassana practice, um, which is a whole other conversation as to why we really do follow and believe kind of Mahasi Sayadaw's approach of of seeing the ways that that can actually put us out of balance in other ways and that it's not necessary and that through this practice that you can come to terms with uh, finding enough concentration just in the pure vipassana. But it, that it is important to see the ways that the mind is trying to create stability through aversion, through craving, and through self, right? Through this sort of constant conjuring of me-ness and, um, kind of how amazing that is, right? Are there places where you can be amazed by that and and inspired and 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 see how functional it is, you know? Um, and of course, we see the places where it's harmful internally, it can be harmful externally. Um, but that there is, a, you, we do need to ultimately develop a genuine interest in these parts of ourselves, in these tendencies of the mind. Um, and understanding the ways that they serve us, understanding the ways that they may harm us as well, um, but not thinking that the heart and mind are ridiculous or stupid or flawed for the fact of doing it, right? Um, this real sense of compassion for how wild the universe actually is, how out of control reality actually is, and um, how unstable everything really is. 
thoughts so that you can appreciate that the mind is able to do this is like incredible, right? It's like incredible that we can feel like a solid me and how wonderful that is. And thank God we can come back to that when we need to, you know, when when the, the beautiful strong forces of mind of vipassana attention aren't there, that there is this like safe place we can come back to and how uh, maybe we could actually appreciate that rather than just berate ourselves for it. Yeah, I just say, you know, a couple more things. I, I think so just of the many things that I could talk about, a few things that I think that came up for me and that I think are important also these days. <clears throat> In terms of like the creation of the self and the formulation of that and the, the constant kind of composing of ourselves that we do, a lot of it is around views and opinions and beliefs. And these are some of like the most precious, cherished and like um, studied things for many of us, you know, that we've been trained on our own or by people we trust and care about to to understand things that we see in certain ways right in the world and we have our opinions about them we have our views and i think the important thing is around the question of views because it does come up a lot in the buddhist teaching right um is to not worry on you don't have to stop having views. So that's like a relief, right? Because it's like, but you can see how threatening it feels. Like if I were to say like, you need to get rid of your views, any like views, you have, they need to go out the window. You can see like what an offense that feels like, you know, um, maybe not to everyone, it sort of maybe depends on our personalities or whatever. Uh, to me, I have very strong views of a lot of things. So it feels like a very, a very deep offense to ask myself to let these things go. Um, but it is important to see what how they function in terms of the mind, in terms of the self, because they are one of the most powerful ways in which we are constantly solidifying ourselves, shoring up ourselves. We're creating a sort of like, uh, it's, a, it's our defense against the constant disintegration of self, um, and it's a and it's a defense against the constant disintegration of the world, right? That it's like it's a it's a dual it's a process that's very related, right? That it's like our views about the world and our views about others. It's not that they're wrong, and of course they're not wrong. Of course your views are right, um, and all of our views are right. Uh, the, the question is is like, what are they serving to do? And that the, to be genuinely interested in that doesn't require necessarily banishment or discipline on that level, but genuine interest, right? Of watching, what is this doing? When you start to go on a, a, a tangent about your perspective or an argument in your mind with someone or this or that, it's just like, what is, what is it doing spiritually for us? What is it doing sort of internally for the self? And, and it's powerful to see the ways in which it very much is like reaffirming the sense of ourselves and other and the world and us, and that we're keeping, um, we're keeping things kind of locked in in a way that feels stable and secure and comfortable and familiar and knowable, even if it's tense, even if it needs constant shoring up and constant repetition. Um, these days, it's like, and we're being fed it. We're very susceptible to it, right? So that there's a way in which you can see news media, everything. It's like the, we're, um, we're very susceptible to shared views the power of shared views, the power of opposing views, not just in the world, that's its whole other level of like 
complexity. Good complexity and bad complexity. But around ourselves, and it's like, oh, where does something feel threatened? And we're using the the sense of a view and of an opinion to kind of solidify it. And then how is that also solidifying the world? And that if we're constantly sort of doing that, what is it? What is the prison that we're holding the world in? What is the prison that we're holding ourselves in? It's like when this this recognition that it's like if we're only ever looking externally and how we feel about this and how we feel about that and what's this and what that, that actually what you see is wherever you look, you're mostly seeing a reflection of yourself that the world is really just a reflection of an internal process that you're projecting outward onto it. But if we're willing to start to look at this and observe it, and and again, it's not with an agenda to get rid of things or to, you know, undo our whole lifetime perspective of things, you know, it's to be careful about being against views. But it's to understand the ways in which like if we can start to observe them and observe the process, that perhaps we won't be so fixated on identified it. And then when we're looking internally or we're looking externally, or no matter where we look, we start to see things as they are, right? Not just as a mirror of ourselves uh, unconsciously that we're putting out in the world. And I think I just want to say this one last kind of piece that it just, it might feel very simple, but I was just so appreciating it on these last, this last retreat of something that Sayuru Ulakana would talk about in, in one of his ta- uh, talks often at um, the Chazo Monastery in, in Burma. There would be a point, I'm sure that it, He, he would always get at some point to explaining how like the question of self and non-self and where we can sort of kind of romanticize and aggrandize this notion of, or an experience of no self and, and what a relief that is and um, how important it is to have that perspective. And, um, and on one hand, that's true. And on the other hand, there's also what he would, he would explain a very simple version of it that is so true, <laughs> that's so important to really get, which is to say, it's like, if you're really looking closely, you don't need to get rid of the self. You don't need to try to annihilate the self or override it or whatever. It's like, if you're looking very closely, if you're concentrated, on a sound, right? Or the experience of the rising of the abdomen. In that moment, or in those moments, the experience of self doesn't arise, right? That there is just the physical sensations and the awareness of the physical sensations, right? Kind of happening simultaneously. And that when the concentration is really firm, even for just a moment, even just for one breath, that that is just what it is. There is just the physicality, right? And just the mentality of the knowing. And that the sense of self does not, is not there, it is not present. And that that is a very important experience to be able to recognize, right? That's something that's not exotic, that isn't hard ultimately. Um, I mean, it's amazing still how hard that can be. <laughs> but but it, it it's, it's not... Um, so distant from or where any of us are in our practice at any given point. The sense that it's like it, the sense of self may then arise, right? You may notice this and then there is a sense of self that arises, but to get that in those moments where the mind, the attention is really concurrent with some experience, that in that concurrence and in that connection and the stability of that, there isn't a sense of self. And that that's enough to give you a deep recognition that the self is not coherent, that it is not all pervasive, that it is not um, 
that it is temporary right, that it arises based on conditions and, and dissipates upon conditions. Uh, it might not always be like an aha, but really actually seeing that that simply and that purely is very powerful. Um, and that this question of like, if on our practice we want to explore the sense of self, that that's like a wonderful way to practice. But it can be very difficult um, because you close your eyes, you, you know, you notice all of the sense doors, you feel like you're you, you're right. you have a sense that you're there, but it isn't quite clear where to look, right? It's like this sense of, is it in the head? Of course, my hand still feels like me. Um, is there a part of it that doesn't feel like it has to do with physicality? The sense of self is very agile, nimble, fluid. And, and that is part of what makes it so difficult to observe and to observe over time is that it is not a thing. It is not actually consistent or coherent anywhere that our experience of it is really changing. Um, and so the sense that one place to remember, and it's rooted in what Sayadaw would say, is to not try to look for your sense of self in space but to look for it in time. This is like a the classic kind of really Theravadan perspective that it's not as focused on emptiness or on um, kind of the spatial dynamics of our experience, that it is the training in, especially in our tradition, is focused on momentary awareness. And that no matter where in space it may seem like some experience is happening, that we can observe it also just in time, right? That in this moment, um, physicality, mentality, physicality, mentality, you know, sound, sight, smell, taste, touch, all of it arising just in these tick, 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 ticking moments unfolding. And um, that the sense of self can be observed as arising in time right, in response to other experiences. So that if you're watching the breath, in one moment, you might not experience the sense of self, it might have it, but then you'll see the self arise. We'll notice, or maybe we won't see it, but at some point we'll see, oh, there's identification with this thought or with this experience. So there is a sense of me, oh, there it is, right? Um, and again, it's not about obliterating the sense of me, but of starting to see it as changing, right? as an incoherent, as um, not all pervasive, not bedrock. Um, the, how important that is, that that is the most important truth, not as some experience of non-self that is like necessarily pervasive and lasts all the, you know, a long time, uh, you know, that can happen. But it's like when the mind feels so insistent, when the mind feels so tight and tense and um, solid, just how important it is to try to watch closely, right? To try to watch more and more closely and start to see that it's like, oh yeah, there is this persistence, right? There's a very powerful tendency of the mind toward whatever it's getting itself into. But then there's a sound, right? Then there's a physical sensation. And even in just a moment, during that sound, there this sense of self isn't there, or the th thought pattern isn't there. Uh, and that that is so important to see, right? It's very important to start to see the ways in which actually this is broken up. That what we think of as solid, what we think of as oppressive in this sort of um, undeniable way as you observe it is more broken up than it appears to be. And just that, just one moment of being like, oh, there was a sound or there was this, and it wasn't the mind, it wasn't me, is enough to start to allow the mind, allow the attention to start to see things more as they truly are, which is the coming and going and the arising and passing of these phenomena the tendency for the mind to contract around experience, develop a sense of self, and then to loosen, to contract and to loosen, to contract and loosen, and that that ends up being so much more of what the practice ends up being about, rather than forcing it loose, trying to loosen, 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 loosen. It's like, no, watching the contraction, watching the relaxation, watching it, and slowly this process of wisdom, disenchantment, um, and liberation unfolds. Okay, 
That would be enough for today. <laughs> that was longer than I thought. I didn't think, I thought I'd take just a little while. So thank you all for um, listening patiently, uh, attentively. And um, we do have some time if anyone has any questions um, about your practice, about anything I've shared. Um, you can, uh, if I remember correctly, there's a button to press somewhere where there's a Zoom hand. Oh, and reactions. You can raise your hand. Um, I'd be happy to answer a question or two or more. or less. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think what you said about how heart wants to kind of protect from kind of like uh, crazy actually what's happening. Um, I don't know how to form the question, but like, I don't want to say well, like, then if it feels so dangerous or so kind of uncertain and um, difficult, what's the point of seeing that? Um, I, it, it's a little more nuanced than that, but I think that's how I, my mouth would convey that question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I think, um, the value comes from the appreciation of the value for all of us has to come from seeing the pain that the resistance ultimately causes us and causes others, right? That the, the only way outside of the sort of skillful means of mindfulness and concentration of, of the only way of coming, finding safety within reality, the only way to, to, to have the sense of sort of stability and, and safety, if you're not going to do that is through the practices and the methods of, of um, craving and ignorance and anger, right? I mean, that's that. So there's a sense of like, but I think it's an important acknowledgement of. I don't know. It's like the archetypal thing of like the hero's journey. It's like, wait, why am I going to go like fight these dragons and? <laughs> you know, like go on this quest to do something. It's like, why don't I just stay home and sort of keep things as they are? And this sense of like, right, where do any of us and each of us find the motivation to go forward or not is very, um, it's very individual. But I think it's always going to come down on some level to this question of where is the pain that we're causing ourselves or others in our avoidance of reality? more than we can bear, more than we want to be responsible for. And where do we feel a, a sense of wanting to be more responsible for kindness in ourselves, wisdom and understanding, patience with other people, generosity? Not that there are, of course, you can't also develop those qualities outside of Vipassana practice. Um, but this sense that the ultimately liberating love from any expectation, right? Ultimately liberating um, peace from 
not caring, right? These things that might seem similar, but that need to be able to like actually be distinguished does require this process of like deep investigation and, and attending to the hardship of it. So it's, it's a very, I mean, I think there's the general answer of when we don't, when we're, when we're avoiding reality, when we're defending our, our hearts are defending themselves against the truth of things that they're creating more karma, right? They're creating more, um, suffering ultimately for ourselves and others. They're creating, they're reinvesting in the, the cycles of samsara, you know, um, that we're trying to find security and all of these things. And there's, some of them are not th that awful, <laughs> right? It's not like everything is just horrible the way it happens. And there's, most people aren't going to try to get free from it. And there's still a value to like trying to be better and creating a good world and, you know, being, having a family or whatever it is people choose to do um, to, to, to try to be good and cultivate these things that there's many ways to do it. But I do think that sense of what keeps us on the path and where doubt arises and, and where do we really not want to show up for the way things are. Sometimes it's important to give ourselves a break, right? To let the mind, you know, it's like when we're teaching retreats, it's like we're very sure and it's like there are times where we need to let the mind get conceptual, you know, read a book or even watch a movie or, you know, go take a walk. Like it's not always about just like hammering in like this is the truth. This is the truth. Things are impermanent. Everything's, uh, <laughs> you know, it's like it's like letting the mind come to rest so that it feels stable enough and safe enough that it wants actually and is actually interested in reality. I've been reading um, a bunch of the like Jataka stories. There's a newer kind of retranslation of a of an a reworking of an old translation of a lot of the Jatakas that someone has um, put out. They're complex. The Jatakas are kind of that, so they're supposedly the stories in the tradition um, of the Buddha's many past lives. Um, so they're their own sort of like compendium. Many of them come out of the main suttas, you know, are sort of drawn from them. Many of them are pre-Buddhist and have nothing to really very little Buddhist element in them. Many of them are are like um, parallel to like Greek fables, Aesop's fables, and you know, they're just kind of ancient archetypal fables. But one of the interesting things is that it's a common theme is this like ex and so monk is sitting alone in the forest and like is sick of it <laughs> and realizes like I should just go home and like I can be it's like I come from a wealthy family and I can have a wife and kids and I'll just do good works and I'll give to the dana I'll give dana to the monasteries and and so then the buddha has to like talk to this person you know of like okay so you know this isn't the first time this happened this is like this formula they're always like in in your past life this also happened so they'll give some story of where the past life this person was also wayward and doubtful and the buddha had to talk him into it before as well you know the buddha in his past life so there's there's a sense of like that i appreciate the honoring actually of the doubt the honoring of how hard it is to actually watch and observe and stay committed to observing and that are some of our deepest patterns what we would maybe use a language of like karmic knots of of protecting ourselves of avoiding reality that it's in there very clearly of like it's ancient you know it's past lives it's like whether we necessarily believe in that framework entirely the sense that we've been doing this for a long time and that it's understandable that it's going to take a while for these uh entanglements to to unbind and so that we need some patience and there's a value to perseverance but there is a way that also we can get destructive we can push too hard and um practice through aversion, aversion to ourselves, right? Trying to get free because we don't like ourselves or free because we're, we, we're tired of existence, you know, which are things, of course, that are going to come up. But to see that, like, ultimately this idea of the, it's neither des the desire for existence nor the desire for non-existence um, that is that sort of ultimately liberated mind. And, and that it's important to give ourselves permission to have maybe a range of periods of intensity and not, you know, if it feels like it's too much and, and to know that we can still stay connected in a different way, you know, over time. And then when the mind feels ready to, to, to feel like it's ready to jump back in, you know, but, but that we don't know, we don't really have a way of having a perspective on the, 
the arc of our process over greater periods of time than you know the lifetime i don't know does that does that answer the question <laughs> sufficiently for now i think so yeah I, yeah I, I i do see like how like hardening of the heart is in some way cultivation of greed hatred delusion in some degrees and um just by watching like really investigating non-conceptually that that is a little bit of different approach from what I'm used to what I would naturally just live um mm -hmm. it's yeah that's enough value for me to think no it's not <laughs> babbling no absolutely I, I think it's um It, part of it is to that dance of like, where do we, not, just trying to be careful about not over castigate, I don't know what the word I'm trying to look for, not over, it's not, it's like the hardening of the heart doesn't always have to feel like existential crisis. It's just like even a little bit, just get that it's understandable, but that the flavor of it is, um, that it's not liberated. That's all. It doesn't need to have a heavy hand, doesn't need to be judged, it doesn't need to be, you know, like tear hair out over it. But of like, oh, really recognizing that this is a contracted when the mind is contracted, knowing that it's contracted. And that's it, you know. Um, without having to feel like you have to have an agenda always to like undo it, untangle, unbind, because you won't want to. If you're always forcing the heart to like open, it won't want to. He won't trust you because you're not trustworthy <laughs> because you're not you're forcing it to to um go into a relationship with reality that's beyond its current potential for mindfulness or care you know and so it's like whatever our it's like always trying to make sure that we're in a in attunement with what is the potential for the mind in that this moment to to show up for whatever's happening and maybe it needs to be from a distance or even ignore it and then other times it can be more you know checking it out examining the texture and flavor in a more nuanced way yeah mm, thanks kim hi. hi um thank you for that um yeah i really appreciate what you said about not forcing the heart when it's not ready. Um, and I think the things that I've been working through, kind of wishing that I was there, um, and not being there yet. And um, I think I've shared before that I'm working through a lot of um, the forgiveness practice. Um, in self-compassion and um, I just wanted to share I um, I had a teacher bring to my attention this verse from the Dhammapada that I revisited this week and I just found it um, so helpful um, in terms of working with self-judgment and working through um, past mistakes and it was um, He who having been heedless is heedless no more, illuminates this world like the moon free from clouds. And I find that so inspiring and so comforting because um, we can't go back and change the past, but we can. recognize and take more skillful actions and free the clouds. <laughs> so that's all, thank you. Yeah. It's so beautiful. I mean, what you're saying and the text. 
it's it's like when it's inspiring and beautiful it's so powerful and then you know sometimes for some of us or some people of course they can be it can feel like the other side of it of hard of how hard how far it feels like we are from that you know at times and and it's so painful you know that word the heedfulness apamada sometimes it's like diligence or just carefulness you know that sense of God, how much we want to be careful, you know, and and how much we don't want to hurt anybody, ourselves or others. Like, really, you know, there's anger, there's frustration, and you really think about, like, do you really want to wound someone? Do you want to wound yourself, you know, in the sense of remorse, you know? Um, and yet, boy, it's just life is just happening so fast. We are inundated by things and we do have these very deep patterns and conditioning that are very hard to be careful with. It's very hard to have that heedfulness sometimes because we're busy and things trigger us, you know, in all the ways that they do. And so that, you know, it's like there's the compassion for past acts, but then there's like the level of it that's just like our daily moment every moment by moment kind of you know flushing out that <sighs> the sense of how hard it is to do this how hard it is to be careful and to not act out of these things and 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 the the humility of recognizing how much more we have to go you know without having that be humiliating is is tricky you know, it's a very delicate thing too. Of like, we put in work, we put in so much work, we put in this much work. We did the, you know, we, and it's still X or Y. You know, and it's like, oh god, <laughs> how do we? Um, sometimes it's very, it can be very hard to bear. You know, but on the other hand, I think that's like that sense of that you're talking about of like. just recognizing the beauty of that possibility, the beauty of that potential of like really releasing, like of not harming, of not creating more problems for anyone or yourself or whatever. And like how worthy a goal that is um, and how many people have pulled it off and how many people are trying to pull it off and, and that there is an acknowledgement. I mean, these Jatakas are a mixed bag, some of them, you know, but there's something about them too that's just like, I really appreciate this part of like, actually, because in the suttas a lot, you don't always see like, this person was having a hard time or this person was having a hard time. And that's a lot of what these are, is like people having a hard time. And the resolution <laughs> is like a little old school of a lot of it, right? But still there's like this sense of like, right, this is hard. This is actually super hard. Um, and it's very hard to face these parts of our hearts and minds and and that it's so worthy and so beautiful. Um, so yeah, I just you know thank you for for bringing that in and you know it's like I can only speak for myself, but I it's it's something that everyone who cares about this, like everyone who really is trying to get free, just we we reckon with this at different points in our lives and. You know, I know what it's like to have reckoned with it up to this point in my life, but I don't know what it's like to reckon with it as the person 10 years from now or 20 years from now or or the person on my deathbed, right? If like, if I haven't gotten fully enlightened at that point, does it feel like it's been a waste? Does it felt like a failure? Like, I, ho I, I really hope that that f doesn't feel like the case, you know, that like, that at that point, it's like, oh, I have enough sense of like, oh, wanting longing, you know, wishing, caring, I care about myself, I care about how, like, that I can still sort of, like, find traction of practice with whatever might be arising in terms of doubt, or whatever might be arising in terms of longing, this beautiful longing of the heart to be free, and the pain of the times where it feels so distant, you know, um, but to be care very, 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 very careful to not use that as a as a self-creating mechanism because that's the thing that's like what's the most incredible almost hilarious thing about that right is that it's the deepest sense of i oh, i 
I'm still like this. I am still not free. I am not in land. And it's like, ah, <laughs> like it's like a double trick. Like not only have you done whatever it is that makes you realize you're not fully in land, <laughs> but then you're reinforcing the self. And it's like, okay, no. Okay, okay, yes, you watch yourself reinforce yourself. It's like, no, doubt, impatience, wanting, aversion, whatever. I didn't see what was happening. It was not clear enough. It's like just moving on, doubt. You know, it's like recognition, keeping the practice going so that we don't use that also as a, as a, a self-builder um, is hard because it really gets at like our deepest aspirations for ourselves, you know. Yeah, thank you for that reminder, because the I part is something that, <laughs> yeah, it's so easy to get lost in. Um, and the still part, you know, I, I I listened to a great talk once where a teacher was saying, responding to someone who was like, how come after all these years, I'm still doing this? And I, for me, it's like, how, how, how was I practicing for 20 years and having these blind spots? And like, after all this time, like still not fully loving and accepting of myself. And I listened to this talk where the teacher was like, the word still is such a judgment. And it's a really harsh one because there isn't like still, there's just like now and now and now. And it was like, oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> you know, I, I'm not still anything and I'm not even I. Um, totally. Really, it's just experience, so. That's great. Yeah, no, yeah. Michelle talks about all that a lot. And I, I think it's just, it's so, it's like that word still, it's like, it's such a great little flag of being like, oh, there's a karmic knot happening somewhere, right? They were very identified with some part of what's happening and that's okay. You don't even need to make that stop. It's just like seeing it, seeing the identification, seeing how, what a, what a tender part of ourselves this must be and how it actually requires a lot of care and patience rather than convincing itself that its perspective is wrong too, right? So it's like, I mean, you're not trying to just like teach yourself a lot. It's not still or not whatever. It's like, it's also, it's like, oh yeah, this is such a tender part that so wants to be free, that still is so pained by it, is still so identified with it. And it's like, oh yeah, where is the, is there a kindness that you can bring to that, a compassion for that pain and how beautiful and, and actually in, in an important ways, how wholesome a uh, kind of suffering, you know, Yay! <laughs> uh, well, really, um, yeah, just wonderful to see you all. It's funny to be back in the the two dimensions. I feel like maybe they'll have three D glasses sometimes for Zoom. That'll be cool. That'll be someone will get rich off of that. It'll still be the same old samsara. So really wonderful to see you all um thank you for coming for supporting the sangha and again i'll be away for a couple of weeks but darine will be here and um so she's really looking forward to seeing you all um and then uh steve and michelle will be back in a couple of weeks so yeah take good care everyone we'll see you soon <laughs> aloha <laughs>